Right, Shane, thanks for coming on the show, the Engage Nation podcast. It's brilliant to have you. Um, let's just get stuck in. Uh, let's hear a little bit about your background, you know, where you, where you got to today, what the journey was. Not particularly a conventional route to a data, the data position that you're in now, but yeah, let's hear it, mate. What's the story? First, Kel, thanks very much for having us. So it was a pleasure, um, particularly talking around data. Um, so my 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 route to this point, I guess, has been is, is an interesting one. So um, my background's more from a marketing commercial perspective. So um, I'm just about to start my 18th season of football at, here at West Coast. So it's been a long journey here, but in sport in general. So I worked at tennis just before I came over to, to here. So I've been in sports marketing and sort of commercial sales for, for good on 20, 20 years now. Um, have we sort of sort of fallen in by just opportunity into the data space? So I've always been intrigued around um, how things work and the data and, and, and audience information, consumer insights and stuff like that. But typically all of ours has been around how do we how do we turn that into revenue? How do we monetize what we've got, all the opportunities that we've got in front of us? So um, we went through a journey where the club went through, um, highlighted a need to go through a transformation process probably around 2018. Um, and at that point in time, we made some decisions to, particularly from a strategic possession, we need to actually really dedicate the resource to look at, okay, how do we transform the business to be ready for the next generation? So the next generation of consumers and fans and how we can get get ourselves ready um, to deal with um, what we need to do to get, to get ourselves organised. So um, I've sort of fallen in, I've learned on the job. Um, but I guess the, the, the thing that I've sort of brought to it is that uh, from a marketing perspective, you've always been asking the question of why, why. I mean, the how is the, obviously we've got technical guys that will look, guys and girls that look at the how we piece it together. But um, the question I guess we always, or for myself, um, uh, look at uh, asking is, is, is the why. So, um, and then how is that going to help the business? Interesting. So what is it about the with the marketing background? You sort of touched on it like there, but I do just want to explore that. What how does that help uh you be a great data person? That that, that particular background. Obviously you use it all the time. Um you have to you have to, you know, you measure it a lot. So um yeah, tell us how that helps. Yeah, for for our industry, so our, our fan base, our members, um, our fans, our consumers, they're our that's our that's our prospecting. That's our number one product. So we need to understand what those what the insights and what the motivations what are the attributes that make our fans, our members tick? And so dealing with um, partners and dealing and looking opportunities. So one of the, the one of the commercial aspects of the role I've had for, for many years is, is working with club partners. And so to be fair, they're the ones that have been driving the understanding about the audience. So one of the key selling points that we have as, as all sporting organisations have is the audience that we reach. We've got a, a, a unique proposition that we, we we have a connection with our fans and audience that's sort of um, unlike any other industry. So when you start to dive into the questions of what are the what's the segmentation look like for that audience, and then understanding what those motivations and and what makes up your audience, as you start to actually ask, you break down that question, we realised that uh, certainly a long time ago that we didn't have enough of that information. We needed to start to collect that and be a little bit more systematic about how we actually start to deal with the information coming in. So typically a lot of that data had been isolated, had been siloed information. And typically back in that, if you're not organized, it's just too cumbersome a process to actually go through and cut that down. So from so the, the original question there is around the marketing aspect is, is actually understanding what the what the audience is and what motivates them to to to, to engage with with our brand. So that's been the driving thing around okay, well every bit of data that we've got does it fall in line with, does this actually fit for the purpose of what our business strategy is, is actually trying to achieve? So um, the marketing side of things has been able to try and tell that story and capture that. So um, that's why it's been a really important part of, we're not, we're not necessarily financial services where the ones and zeros, you know, tell the story necessary about, you know, the, um, um, around buyer behavior and that sort of stuff. Ours is probably more understanding what the, the actual consumer's thinking and, and actually what they're doing, what they're saying. By, and that happens through ticket sales. It happens through what they say, how they how they engage with our competitions and stuff. Yeah, great. Interesting. So 
at a at a granular level, um, that might sound really sort of like a te- it evokes thoughts of you know tedious and tedium and numbers and um, what so there's probably some sort of passion involved here. And for you, what what is that that one thing about your role that you just go, I love this bit. You know, what is that? <laughs> which which what aspect of your role is that? Yeah, well, it's 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 a unique. My role that we've got it's particularly here as well as it's one that's sort of been sort of morphed into. I've been had the opportunity to really create it ourselves. So, um, so I've got a combination of it's 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 for the most part a strategic role. So I'm not a data person. I'm more of a marketing person. I've learned on the job around um, some of the mechanics of data and and I often get confused, uh, particularly when engineers and vendors are talking at length in detail as well i need to slow it down and i'm i'll, I'll be uh, i won't make apologies for actually you know asking them to repeat and actually break that down because my role as an intermediary is to be able to break uh, uh, is to that exchange from a technical perspective is you spin that into um, an explanation or a story that i can tell um, key stakeholders or executive uh, within the group and and break that down into does that fit into the business so being able to having that flexibility to be able to um, work with technical people, but also then breaking that down um, and then um, telling that story from for stakeholders, I enjoy that part. Um, having problems to solve and 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 working through that, some of them can't be solved and some of them take a long time to solve. Um, I find really quite fascinating, and and it's when you actually start getting more and more into the data landscape, you just realise some of the mechanics are really fascinating to to see them, but also understanding in parallel what that story is that's telling as far as what does that mean for the for our for our whether it's for our business, but for for our members and our fans. So um, that's the part. I certainly like getting. Um, uh, the hands dirty as well. So even just jumping into reports and analytics and actually going through the data and crunching the data, well, we spend countless hours just going through lines and lines of, of um, consumer data. Um, it can be tiresome, but when you do actually get through and actually get the results and get solutions, then yeah, it's quite rewarding. Brilliant. So yeah, I'd sp- I suppose you're the uh, the data translator. That's probably, you probably change your job title actually, it's data translator. Yeah. Um, and again, well, um, learning on the job. So a lot of times it needs to be translated to me as well. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but it, I think that was, a, that's, that's what, actually a good, uh, that was, I was going to say, that's actually quite a good listen for anyone. I think, um, I imagine I'm probably digressing slightly, but it just made me think of like any junior person who's in a meeting and they don't understand what's going on. I mean, if, if you can put your hand up and go, sorry guys, just going to stop you there. I actually don't understand that. Can you explain it to me? It's actually a right to do. You don't look like you don't, you're not being silly. You're actually being thorough. <laughs> Otherwise, you can just sit there nodding your head, going, "I've no idea what's going on here." That's a good little lesson. Yeah, that, that's that's probably true for any role, really. Um, I yeah. think once you start to feel a little bit more confident about where you, where your place is, that you should always be asking that question and not going along with the flow. But particularly in data, because it's moving so fast as well, you'd be surprised at how many other people are, are thinking the same thing in that room as well. And and you also got to remember the the audience that you're speaking to and trying to obviously convey that information. Not everyone is technically savvy, and not everyone understands the. And that the, the, there's a world of acronyms in in the data landscape as well, and being able to break that down. And um, so um, I, I think from that perspective, if the questions are around, um, you know, if you're new coming into that place as a data analyst. Um, certainly putting your hand up and asking the question, but it's probably also the, going deeper than that is the the why question as well. I keep on going back to that question. Analysts typically look at it uh, very methodically and there's a there's a question to, to answer and you need to um, either manipulate and transform the data to be able to give you the, the, the answer that you want to try and tell. Um, along the way, if you can get in the habit of actually asking, you know, why is the business looking at that or looking ahead of um, of what does that mean for the rest of the business and then opening that opportunity and that conversation with the rest of the business, then socialising that and socialising that to the group is going to be, I think, if you're looking at it from a, from a person coming in from a data perspective, would be one of the biggest things is being able to socialise that with the, with the organisation. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, I wonder if we could get a little bit practical here and, and maybe an example if you're able to share around 
Was there, has there been a decision? I'm sure this has happened at some point if you've been there for so long, but um, has there ever been something where you've gone, you've had a bit of a gut feel about something and you've gone, I think this is what Annex, whatever the decision might be, we should do. Then you crunch the numbers and it told you something totally different. You're like, wow. <laughs> I mean, data led decision making really does flip things on its head. And, you know, there's a root, there's a space, I think there's always a space for gut feel, right, when you're making a decision. But, you know, the empirical evidence might say otherwise. If, can you give us an example of when that might have happened and it changed, it course corrected you? Yeah, I think um, footy is a really funny, uh, sport in general is a really funny thing um, in that. Um, you could have all the data in the world, but at the end of the day, um, the most important aspect that or variable that controls how things will turn out is what happens actually on the field, the wind loss. Mm. And so you have all this empirical data, you have all this information around, you know, exactly who came to what and, um, and who was watching what and who was consuming stuff. If you end up losing the game, it doesn't necessarily look like it has has an impact, but it doesn't necessarily drive the number one motivation of, of what what fans and members are doing. So, um, and that's one thing. So, just not not a specific um, example of it. We've done we, we looked at a lot of our say for instance we're a content producer. We produce a lot of content and looking at the numbers and the time on screen and and what we thought um, with a number of our um, our weekly shows uh, were starting to shop that was starting to come through. Actually, when you actually look through the numbers and the time on screen, it didn't actually sort of convey. So it sends a different message. But you need to take it in context of the timing of when that in that period as well. And um, it's it, it's it, it, on reflection. If you look at where our team has been in the last twelve months, we we haven't been performing you know, particularly well. So. What happens then is obviously that gives you a, a skewed understanding of what those um, audience figures and our, our attendance figures look like as well. So um, it's a long way to uh, answer around um, looking at the data not, doesn't necessarily give you an exact understanding of what's actually what's going on because we've got a very unique industry. Mm, yeah, I imagine some things like when when you when you're not winning winning games and you're not performing as well as you'd like to, you know, there's usually more comments it's like people leaving like people who leave reviews on websites you know you're much more likely to get uh feel like you want to leave a review or a comment of some sort when you know it's negative it's just human nature it's sort of like a survival thing um yeah, but when it's, and, uh, and that, and that, that skews it too right yeah that, that and that's with everyone i think anyone that works in the sporting industry would understand exactly that. i mean that's at the very heart of everything is if you lined up two games and the experience that you provided in the, um, uh, the communication uh, process and the way that you dealt with, let's say, for instance, the match day, you line two of those, those up against each other, you win one and it's an exhilarating one and you had a poorly performing one, the different um, feedback and the response that you get back is completely different. Even though that you've done everything possibly to be able to deliver the best possible event or experience that you can do. And that's just... That's just um, that's what you you sign up for. That's just um, uh, life in sport, and that's across all sporting industry. Yeah, no, no doubt. Wouldn't be surprised if like beer sales were like a little bit higher on losses when you're on thumping losses when there's just not much else to do other than just. No, you'd be yeah. It's, it's quite funny. So <laughs> even if you just think about your own um, uh, consumer habits and 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 how like in watching um, say say for instance footy. If it's a yeah. really nail baiting close game, you, you don't want to leave your chair. So you're not that's prepared right. to go and line up and whatever you've got left in, in your uh, in your cup is that's gonna to have to see you through that last quarter. Whereas if it's a blowout, then yeah. it can get pretty either way, winning or losing can get can get yeah. pretty rough. Yeah, no, really interesting. And I suppose that does, yeah. You you almost gotta put them into buckets and then and then and then sort them underneath those based on close game, blowout get win, blowout loss you know that those three sort of sectors and then you know try and then try and compare those parts i suppose uh, that's really yeah. interesting yeah and I, it's it, and we we'll keep on obviously i'll come back to it a fair bit because there's been a lot of decisions that we've made internally particularly when looking at say for instance uh, going out and getting some quantitative and qualitative feedback from members and fans and you just got to pick the timing around that and obviously you want to be trying to be objective and neutral and um uh, about the process the timing and having that as um statistically as as as, as um 
you know, accurate as possible. But unfortunately, the emotions sort of tend to con control a lot of that feedback. So it was just not, it, we decided not to embark on a couple um, uh, opportunities that were ahead of us uh, late last year, just purely on the fact that the team performance just, it's just not appropriate for us to be going asking some of those questions at yeah. that time, I don't think. Sure. Oh, well, this hum human emotion and behaviour is just so inconvenient sometimes, isn't it? From uh, the rigidity of <laughs> of data evidence. Oh well. Um, so let's talk about you know um, how West Coast leverages so centralised data. Not always the case everywhere. Um, but no, you guys have been doing it. You know, what does that enable you to do digitally? So centralising the the data here at West Coast. I mean, it's. It's, it's a journey, not necessarily a, a destination from that point mm. of view. So we're continually trying to get better about getting all the data. And there's a, so once you actually start going through the order of it and you look at all the different data and the ways in which the processes that we're doing across the business, it's it became, it actually becomes quite enormous. Um, we went through that process. Um, we're probably three, four years into that process. Um, we're in a really good space at the moment, particularly over the last 12 months. We've uh, we've come through um, with some really great um, uh, uh, technologies that we've been able to enable. Um, the importance for us um, is that there's a there, there's a couple there's a number of issues, a number of things that we've been able to sort of bring to the to the front. So probably the key thing for us um, from an automation automation perspective. So when, once we've been able to consolidate our data, we've been able to streamline some of the processes that normally are being quite cumbersome. So when you get the data into a process into a, a space where you can easily um, use that data, and, and again we talk about doc democratizing data, getting into a space where some of our key stakeholders and champions across the business can actually start to act on that straight away. Typically, um, you know, before we went through that transformation process, everyone wanted the question, and we had kind of the data there in its raw format, but the process of being able to transfer that was just too long, and you need to be able to react on these things reasonably quickly. But now we've been able to get into a, a format centralized, and we've got data that's actually been used for multiple different purposes as well. So you can see those efficiencies and optimizations there. So what we've been able to do is, is allow us to be able to focus on asking more, interrogating the, the, that, that information a little bit better and using it a little bit quicker and a little bit and optimizing that information. So that's probably one of the key things. So from what we're actually been able to output, um, we're, about, we're, we're able to get a little bit more personalized with some of the information as well. So we're, and we're segmenting that data as well. Um, our goal is actually to reduce the number of bulk emails that we send out um, to, to our members. And, and really bring into more tailored, personalised um, uh, uh, communications that go out to our, our our members and fans. So the only way to be able to do that is by centralising that data. Um, we spent a fair bit of time, obviously, on the end-to-end -end stack, and um, CRM is obviously fundamental to that. Um, at the heart of everything with CRM, it's all around our members' data and our members and fans' data, and we like to obviously attribute that to people. These are these aren't just numbers on a page, but these are contacts. So we build a profile around that. So CRM really at the whole heart of, of our, um, if you call it our MarTech stack, um, is fundamental. So that's where, that's the starting point that we, we bring everything into. And then from a last mile perspective, as far as the, com the comms perspective, we obviously invested fairly a fair bit into, and we've done a lot of work with, with Engage ORM around being able to deliver that to our uh, marketing um, cloud, um, service so through our uh, marketing automation platform as well and then through that dynamic contact that gives us a lot of flexibility to communicate in different ways so centralizing the data has been um, a it's such an a, a, a important aspect of driving um, engagement with fans moving forward brilliant great to hear and and is there anything from a technological perspective or something that you are looking at in the next next few years that, uh, on, you know, or, or even shorter term than that, that you'd like to, you'd like to, that you're excited about, that you'd like to leverage that might, you know, and what will that let, let, might allow you to do, I suppose? Yeah. So th there's a, there's a couple of things that we're, um, we're looking and investigating now. And there's a couple that it's kind of, it's like that you know, a movie's coming out and you want to watch and you can't wait for it. We just, it's, it just hasn't come out yet for us or we're not ready to, to, to go out and watch it. So um, 
a lot of the ML and the AI space is um, is something that we're preparing ourselves for. Um, we know mm. that it's a it's a big opportunity. Um, we we've dabbled a little bit with it um, um, as a, as a club. Um, probably our football department's probably the most advanced as far as working in the in that space. But I think that's the buzzword for everyone: is is where do we from from a machine learning and, and AI perspective, what can that drive? What insights can that collect? Particularly with the amount of data points that are actually starting to collect and actually getting more um, organised. The reason why we put off a lot of that heavy investment in that space is um, we need the back the back end to be able to drive that the insights and the and and the, and the the ML is going to be determined by how how clean and how good that data is. Uh, what, um, um, so rubbish in is going to be rubbish out when you look at it from machine learning. So we know it's there for us, and we know that we can get some insights around next best offer, um, and how can we engage better with our fans and start to see better um, patterns and uh, and trends and insights from those. Um, however, we've um, it's probably now the preparation of getting, and again, we talk about centralizing data and getting structured. It's so the combination of structured and unstructured data together. Some of that contextual information that we've got on fans that we're starting to build, getting that into a clean space so that, and getting enough of that, that, that data and a, a good run up of that data to actually have really healthy insights to be able to drive ML. Yeah, great. I mean, yeah, it's a bit of a minefield, all that stuff, but you know, it's certainly coming with a, like it or not, but you're right. You need to be, you need to get all set up for it first. So, the um, if we look at again, and we touched on it a little bit, but I do just want to jump into um, Shane the translator um again, um, what what some of the techniques um for that you might use to help visualize some of the hard numbers that you've got to uh the senior stakeholders so they may not particularly data savvy but they might just want to see outcomes you know they you know they want to see you know what it does what does it mean you know what i mean so so that's i mean you should see what your what techniques you employ to help sort of tra- that, that that translation pro- process because that's that's one of the toughest things to do yeah yeah if that's a key thing and um from a reporting perspective as well um a lot of the time less is more particularly when you're um piecing together information for say for instance your executive team um you've got to remember um at putting the the story just needs to be wrapped up into a um into a parcel that's going to be fit for purpose so um so we look at uh, so for instance we look at from a reporting perspective there's a lot of information that we'll, we'll have a lot of detailed information and we've got that ready together but then we obviously just summarize a lot of that that and we try to make it more visual than uh, necessarily heavy yeah. um, text and heavy um, tables and stuff like that. So sometimes at the end of the day, it really is um, a couple numbers that count. So it's just really top line. What it is uh, exactly, whether it's a percentage or it's actually a figure or if it's, a, if it's cost or a number. Um, the way we try to do it, when we're trying to explain how and how accurate that data, that's probably... Um, and interesting. So as far as what we're trying to do and um, and how we've gone about getting this information, visually, I'm a visual person myself, is trying to actually just try and diagram, uh, to, 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 to um, visualise that and that theory diagram is on how we try and tell that story to the, to um, stakeholders, key stakeholders and here is probably trying to explain and break it down as simple as possible. Because to be honest, when you get into the nuts and bolts, um, a lot of the real detail um, they're just not interested in understanding um, that the how. They just need to know the end result of what we've got to. So um, when we break that down, and that's and, and again, if I look at it from my previous role, from a, you know as a commercial manager, you looked at it just from the top line. It's like, okay, well, what what are those key metrics that we need to know? Uh, been able to sort of go through that and actually continuously go, okay, it's just too much information to take in. Uh, and you need to be able to direct them quick, quickly to the information really that they've asked for as well. And being able to interpret exactly what they're looking for, there's a skill set there of breaking that down. So, and that's the translator role that I potentially have with, say, for uh, 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 an engineer that's up to just looking at specifically, you've asked this question, I'm going to provide you the answer to that. And actually then going, yeah. okay, that answer needs to be cut down. We need to bring that down into, okay, there's three things that we need to show here. Um, so yeah, look, it's it's a 
it's a um, it's a skill set I certainly enjoy trying to do, and I've sort of got to improve on bringing that down because sometimes when you get lost in the the data conversation around that, you can actually get a little bit more technical. And and often a lot of the, the guys and girls who will say, look, just just break it down. What does that actually mean? So. Um, it's, yep. a, it's, a, it's a never-ending um, challenge uh, working through that. And will be forever, I'd say. It was funny. We um, we actually shared something on our <laughs> little plug to our LinkedIn page. Yeah. But um, we actually shared a graphic on on, um, on data today around the It's like a few few images, right? It's like a Lego, a, a bunch of Lego all scrambled up and on the ground. That's just data. Then it's sorted and it's put into different colors. Then it's arranged and it's starting to take some shape presented visually and you know something you know probably what you were talking about with you know a nice co- yeah, column graph or chart or something like that and then um the lego pieces actually become you know a house you know and that's presented yeah. with a story um so there's probably that storytelling component as well as just the visualization right yeah well it's a really good that's a, that's really good um sort of an analogy i'll send it to um <laughs> yeah it's so, so, so most people, when they look at data, they just think that it's really, uh, they see the end product. So you, you obviously build and stitch together and you have this nice, uh, this, this table and it's all brought together. They don't realize yep. that, particularly as you get more, you know, unstructured data coming in as well, they, they just don't understand why it needs to go through so many different processes, the curation and transform process. And, and certainly I don't understand the necessarily the, the really finer details of that, that, that process, but I understand that there's a very, um, uh, stringent or uh, very um, extensive process that a lot of our data goes through, particularly when we're collecting safe information from our websites, which come in JSON format, which is gobbledygook if you look at it from a, just an layman person looking at it. So yeah. you try and piece that together with um, structured, um, you know, typical old school um, database data, or SQL data or um, the CRM data. Um, you know, you can't, they can just don't, it doesn't just marry up automatically. And, and, and trying to explain that to, again, you look at, say, key stakeholders, is that the process actually does take time and energy mm. to be able to put it into a format that you can use. Otherwise, um, you know, we would have been doing this 10, 15 years ago. Um, otherwise, there's no need for this particular skill set. So, and there's a reason why we haven't, you know, prior to this operation, if I go back to what I was talking about before, is that when you democratize that that data, you can now actually act on that data quickly and get that data in that format takes a lot of um, uh, energy and resource to be able to get into that format. Uh, and I think as you mentioned before, you, they only see the final product when you actually walk out with the, the house that's built out of Lego. Uh, they don't see the, the 5,000 pieces that are actually sitting on the on the table and someone's pieced that, pieced that together over you know, 50, 60 hours. Yeah, no, totally get that. It's a good one. Um, so we'll d- dive out a little bit now. Um, that's really interesting, mate. Um, the there's been a fair bit in the news probably in the last six months around the uh, the practice of a sort of or, or uh, negative press around people data leaks and that sort of thing. Um, how do you you and your team sort of you know implement? What do they implement to avoid sort of that unethical practices from, you know, the sensitive information of your customers? How do you protect it? Yeah, uh, really good question. Um, and that's, it's a massive challenge that, you know, obviously the events of late last year as well exposed that, you know, some of the, the big players that you expect and you entrust those people to have really strong measures in place to protect that data. Um, the, even those, they're, they're vulnerable as well. So we certainly went through an exhaustive process, um, not necessarily as a result of that. We were always going through that as well. We've done some some audits of um, where those black spots might potentially be for us. Um, we certainly intensified some of the security around um, our our cloud security and 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 moved some um, uh, uh, made some changes obviously to, to, to adapt to that as well. So we certainly doubled down on some of the security, but I guess what it fundamentally, are, um, and this is a, a big problem, I think that's gonna challenge everyone that's actually in this data space is that particularly if you're, look, you're dealing with um, customers and fan, fan data, is that there's this appetite and this absolute demand for personalization from consumers, from fans and members. They, they, 
particularly when you get a really good um, uh, experience, you kind of almost expect everyone to be providing that as far as a digital experience. And so to be able to personalize that data is actually takes a lot of information that you need to divulge to be able to, A, you need to have some really strong identity resolution. So you need to be able to get in there and actually understand who it is that actually has provided that data. Um, and you need to collect that data, those that data, that data points. So there's that first for personalization from the consumer, but then at the, at the, um, in, in converse, you know, in, in, um, direct sort of, um, uh, pulling against that is the fact that everyone's starting to get a little bit more, um, pessimistic or a little bit more skeptical about data and sharing data, particularly around some of the leaks that happened as well. So you've got this ever increasing, um, blocking of data and sharing of data as far as your own personal data. However, there's an expectation that we want you to be able to understand, no, this is me that's coming to this particular service, this out there service. Why don't you give me exactly what I need rather than the generic cookie cutter uh, information that you're providing to everybody else? So that would be the biggest, um, I think, impact that you've got this closing um, um, uh, pressure that's coming on securing data, you know, keep your data post, close to your chest and that's, uh, and, and that, along with that desire to go, you know, I'm, I want you to understand more about me so I can get a better experience. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And uh, uh, something that you said there sort of sparked, sparked a, a fresh question that I haven't prepared for you, but uh, you know, you'll be right. Um, who, who do you think um, is your competition? The reason I ask that, like, when people use technology now or they have, you know, they're, they're engaging with something they might be ordering something on Amazon, for example. And, uh, certainly in the, in the UK where, where I've been the last few years, uh, next day delivery for pretty much anything I want is my, is the experience I kind of expect now. So, uh, because of that, um, I now expected it every, uh, everywhere. So when I say, yep. you know, who's the competition, is it the other clubs or is it, just is it Amazon, you know, we've got, you know, not in competition in the traditional um, meaning of that, but you know, that that's the experience you've got to, you've got to chase. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a unique industry. So, um, and we're also the modern sporting club is actually quite diverse. And as far as what it's kind of club offering is. So at the heart of it, we, we play foot games of football. So, um, but we sell merchandise, we sell tickets, but we also produce content and we engage our fans through content. Um, hmm. And so it's quite a diverse um, sort of portfolio of our offering or product that we've got with um, as, a, as a sporting, as a club. Um, however, the unique thing about us is from a sporting club is that um, typically we're talking to West Coast fans. Um, we're not necessarily talking to um, whether it be Richmond or Collingwood fans, um, we have our fan base. There is a very, very small portion of neutral that are probably ready to sway, and that's probably more the um, emerging kids that are coming through. They're getting exposed to it for, and all through multicultural um, avenues that are getting exposed to football for the first time. But typically, um, we've got a very hardened sort of prospect or uh, a fan base that we can... So we're not necessarily competing... Um, from a um, business perspective, certainly on field with other clubs. So in that instance, um, typically there's a fair bit of sharing and, and collaboration with a lot of the clubs um, around certain aspects of the business. So we work there, but your point around some, it probably be more around um, you're competing for other um, others, say for instance, the entertainment and other industries where they're, you're competing for that time, that time slot. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know, we look at uh, what's happened since COVID, um, you know, crowds just haven't been the same as they were back then. And people went on and, and just went on with their lives and, and found different things to be able to do. And particularly around the home is, a, is a probably a big competition for us is just competing for people just deciding to do more DIY around the house. So that that four hour commitment to coming down to the ground sometimes that that's what was challenged a little bit during that period as well and, and something that we worked through so it's not necessarily just the other clubs that um that we compete certainly where everyone wants to try and um if there's an opportunity to to be best at something uh, yeah. but typically um for the most part of the business yeah you collaborate a fair bit with the other clubs as well yeah great no, good 
it's competing with the couch as well with all this uh people used well, to sitting back and watching and yeah. watching stream and streaming it so... streaming now yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, and and we can play a role in that as well. So um, you know that second screen, and 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 we know that, um, and 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 that is a real challenge in it as well. So we know that we're far from um, uh, delivering a really good experience from a second screen perspective, particularly on match day as well. So we fortunate we play um, at um, the, our home ground here at Optus Stadium is is a fantastic venue for for watching mm. sport. Um, so we, we, we do a lot as far as engaging from the screens, um, the information, the data that coming through, a lot of it is a little bit slow, so we can't really enact a lot of the data coming from the insights of the ground, but, um, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a funny one when you, when you look at, um, the match day experience, um, you've got competing, um, commercial um, sort of interests as far as the stadium and their what they want to try and achieve through the experience there the ticket uh, the ticket provider um, and then the club that actually there's actually the, the rights holder that actually um, you know performing at that particular venue as well they don't necessarily um, uh, connect and and are working in unison all the time so th that's a challenge that you have for delivering that match day experience. You might you might have just added one of them here, but do you think how how could this sort of from a maybe you didn't the same, but the Australian sport and entertainment industry, if you will, um, how 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 sort of how do you say data literate do you think that is in compared to some because we are sort of starting to talk about some other industries here as well, um, you know how 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 far along are they, you know where 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 are they yep. advanced, um, and where where do they need to do some work? Yeah, I think. From a so if you could break that down into a couple of parts, so from a um, a high performance and say from a from an actual operation, so the game day performance for us, say football, um, um, they're reasonably advanced from being able to what they from the data collection and the actual processing and what does that mean and really embedding that. I think um, Australia's actually, from what I understand, is you know is is, is really. Um, up there as far as leading that 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 movement um where i think we're, we've been slow to follow suit is around the business side of things the consumer side and being able to engage and use that and um and delivering that from a match day experience so there's probably a number of factors for that um and, and I, I say that in comparison to but uh, uh, for both um say australian markets to for instance say us and maybe other international markets but also looking at it in comparison to other industries as well. So um, you're looking at some of the entertainment industries. I think they're a little bit more advanced because uh, that's obviously they're they they they're more have been more reliant on delivering a really good experience because that's at the heart of say for instance TV networks and other entertainment streaming services as well have been really strong. I think financial services have got it really well as because uh, obviously they've been a lot more competitive and been exposed to you know that digital experience for a lot longer as well and it's been at the heart of their business now they've had to really pivot and rotate to that into, uh, into that space as well and i think that the clubs and that might be also through resourcing and being able to actually have enabled themselves to be able to do that haven't been as advanced in that space Probably the other area that really impacts that as well is, and I was sort of maybe discussing that a little bit before, is that there are a couple of different key stakeholders in the delivery of that experience as well. And yeah. there may be competing different um, KPIs for each one of those stakeholders that don't necessarily align together. Um, so if you look at, as I said, the stadium will have different rights that they need to maintain. And so you look at, for instance, West Coast and, and Optus Stadium, at the heart of the, what, what we do, um, our digital experience is we have our partnership with Telstra and Telstra are fantastic at driving um, the content and delivery of the content through our app and through our website. But then we also um, play at Optus Stadium, uh, which is a direct competitor of, of Telstra and they have their app as well. So at the heart of that, you've got conflict in being able to share the data around the egress and the actual uh, movement of, of um, of uh, patrons around the venue to the actual um, football content and the delivery of that match day experience. So there in itself, you can see there's not necessarily alignment at that particular level as well. So they're always been um, 
that's always been a little bit of a bottleneck to, to, to real growth in that. But there's ways you can get around that. And that's what we're trying to obviously work through. Um, and it's just a little bit more of a slower, um, probably a slower pace that some of the other markets are going through. So during the season, uh, you are, uh, especially, certainly at Clubland, it's almost like you're just sort of running and round around and it's fast paced and, you know, you don't get a, don't get a chance to come up for air a lot of the time. Um, the the players have an off season. They have a pre season where they you know get in the gym. They get stronger. They get better. Um, how about how about in the front office, mate? Do you guys uh, apart from going to the gym, which you almost certainly do? Um, do you have, do you do you guys? Where do you get? Is that a good time for you guys to work on some new innovation or bring something else in and you know do your reviews as you would every year, I suppose, and and see where you can improve um year on year. Yeah, well, despite what most um, most people might think, that there's not really an off season when it comes to the administration process, administration mm. process um, at Clubland, and that would be for anyone that's in um, football club or any sport sporting organisation that's professional. Um, uh, certainly, the, the the players go through their process where they they go off and they and they and they prep themselves. Even 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 the players now need to obviously um, do a fair bit of training in their in their off time to make sure they're prepared for for day one as well. But um, the calendar for a modern AFL cl- um, club is 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 full. So in fact, probably a lot of our um, area, uh, business units are probably more busy um, in those. Um, the out of season times than they are, or just as busy as they are in season as well. So um, it generally is a 360, well, 12 month a year um, um, process of getting a season up and going, particularly when you cross uh, AFL with AFLW. We have a waffle team as well. I know some yeah. clubs have got um, other different teams as well. So it becomes quite a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a it's a lengthy process. You've got to find your moments there. you also got to find your moments when you're actually going to look at new projects as well. So you do have windows where you go, okay, there's an opportunity for us to now get into that and try and see if we can um, uh, delve into some of those consumer habits and, and insights and see if we can draw some of that out now ahead of the season because we know once we get going, it's just going to be too busy. So we're probably in a small period right now for a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden, you know, pre-season starts again and you're kind of more in operational um, mode. So it's, um, yeah, there, there not really is, there's not really a down time when it comes to certainly not an AFL. Yeah, so what I'm hearing, what, what, what question is then, you know, is it difficult to be, Super strategic when you know you're always in this sort of operational, always in this operational mode. How 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 difficult is it to just sort of forest from the trees every now and then? Yeah, yeah, and and that's probably um, why I um, enjoy the role that I I play now at the club um, the most is um, again having been um, from a commercial perspective being in that operational day to day. You, you're absolutely right. So you your your you, your main goals around delivering that particular season and then you have one mm. kind of half eye on on the following season as well um the club's obviously made that a strategic decision that we really need to invest in resource up to make sure that we capture the best of this opportunity to transform or the transformation um, pr- uh, process using data so my role from a strategic position is to look at some of the now but also look at what the next couple of horizons look like for for the club so we went through quite an exhaustive um, strategy business plan process. You know, that's changed a fair bit. A lot's actually changed, you know, even in technologies happened since we, we went through that process. But um, that's the beauty of the role at the moment. Uh, I, I might be looking at stuff that we probably can't even actually enable until 24, 25. Uh, and then we'll then couple that with, okay, we've got stuff that needs to go out later on this afternoon. Let's actually make sure that something's happened with the data set that we've got. We need to now get that um, set to go today. So um, we're, we're fortunate from a club where we've been able to provide that opportunity to be able to look at it from a long-term perspective, but also then been able to be nimble enough to be able to act in the now and, and look at opportunities because sometimes opportunities come out that you, that you can't necessarily plan for. Yeah, I'll tell you what, there's probably a few... Uh... Three, five, three to five year strategies and plans that got thrown straight in the bin uh, <laughs> in the last few years. But anyway, that's uh, that was the disruption that happened, and ultimately these things happen. So you do have to be quite agile. 
Well, that, that, that's the classic. And, um, you know, there's a funny story there around um, the the work that we've done with, with Engage RM. So um, when we started this process, obviously we talked about going through a business strategy and we went through an exhaustive process of going through that. Because get, again, getting back to the question of, you know, what do we want to do? Why do we want to try and do that? And let's be very clear about the business goals that we want to tru- uh, achieve and then get the, um, the platforms and the technology to support that business goal. And we went through all that process and we went through a, an exhaustive review process to look at vendors and, and, and then on, and so we had sign off to go down a pathway in February of 2020. And then all of a sudden the world just turned on its, on its head and everything that we, we were about to commit to was completely just, was gone. And then I know a couple of months down the track, um, had a conversation with, um, Ned and, and, and Brett from, from your team and there was an opportunity for us to work together and, and work through that process and come through and you know from that that was pos- you know that was the spark that kept a lot of our, our um, um, the the vision that we've started to work through at West Coast moving forward and since then we've been able to get more stability around the industry itself and now we've sort of built up from that but the plans and some of the ideas that we had pre-COVID completely different. So we've had to sort of change the way and, and um, we've gone through that process. Um, and then it started with Sierra and we changed a couple of ways that we were going about how we were going to filter data through our stack and, and Sierra became a very core component of that as well. So yeah, sometimes, um, you know, what could be a disaster can turn into a really good opportunity as well. Yep. No, absolutely. I think we all endured that one. Shane, thank you very much for jumping on. That was such an interesting chat. Brilliant to hear some of the inner workings down at the Eagles. And uh, best of luck for the season, but not too much luck. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. Uh, Thank you very much, mate.